multilateralism used to be perceived as an advanced and natural progression of society. However, as globalization has deepened over the decades, we are seeing some countries reconsidering whether it is the right way for revitalization and picking up unilateralism tools in their policies. Why is multilateralism losing its charm? What exactly is the soil nurturing the rise of unilateralism and populism? And what will be the way ahead for this world? To answer these questions and more, I'm very happy to be joined by Daniel J. Atkinson, who is the director of the Trade Center of Cato Herbert Stiefel. And sitting next to him is Mr. Wang Huiyao, president of the Center for China and Globalization. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Rui. Welcome to our dialogue. Uh, Daniel, first of all, are you surprised? Or were you surprised, to be more exact, uh, two years ago when President Donald Trump took office and started his campaign of uh, unilateralism? I was certainly surprised that he won the election. Uh, and his uh, tack with respect to trade policy is a major departure from the way things have been done in the United States for about 85 years, going back to 1934. I think presidents, the last 13 presidents, uh, saw trade as a win-win proposition, saw trade as a way to foster good relations among nations, understood that, uh, that having rules, multilateral rules, was the best way to, to encourage countries to behave within the, the system. President Trump uh, brings a new uh, model to, to town, and his model is that trade is a zero-sum game. It's, uh, it's Team America against Team China, or Team America against Team Europe, uh, and it's, uh, it's, uh, the, the pie is constant, so you have to win, and, and multilateralism is not the approach. It's uh, t taking a more unilateral approach so that the United States can carve out what it wants for itself seems to be uh, the motive uh, driving the president's uh, trade policy. Henry, uh, President Trump is not alone. He's not a lonely heart. He enjoys a steady 40% approval rating at home. Whatever he says, whatever he does, he always enjoys diehard support from an electorate that is also very sentimental about uh, the impact of globalization. What do you think of this broad background against which the rise of populism as well as uh, protectionism are gaining momentum the world over, particularly in the European Union. Look at the Brexit. Yeah. No. I, I, again, it's, uh, this is really a, a very uh, serious, uh, uh, you know, question. Uh, of course, uh, I remember very well when, when President Trump took office. Uh, the first day, he, he, he abandoned the TPP, which took U.S. Uh, you know almost uh, you know 19 years to negotiate that. And uh, so that's that's a, a strong indication that he's. Uh, He's really interested in unilateralism, and uh, he's, he put it very blankly at his uh, inaugural address that American first. So, so I think that has a, a big impact. But I, I understand the background of that. You know, we, we already had the BX set, but we also have, uh, you know, this rusting belt, uh, this deglobalization has impact on the American heartland. And uh, the reason for that, as we just had this uh, center, of, you know, China and globalization conference, uh, we actually talk about these issues. There is, there is a global governance falling behind global practice. And uh, we, have, we see the emerging of a multilateralism in, a, in, a, in the post-war era. And then they're flushing room, ev you know, mushroom everywhere and, and they take a big chunk of a, a, you know, profit and tax. And then, according to an IMF study, there's, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a decline of pro corporate taxes on that. So, so the tax is not benefiting the home country and the host country. You know, they put it somewhere else. So, so that's probably the problem. China, you know, probably also has been emerging very quickly, but then China probably took all the blame, uh, most of it. I see Europe has, has a similar problem because the multinational has been really flourishing, uh, operating worldwide, but the profit may not be necessarily benefit their home country. You know, that, uh, you know, you see uh, GM, Ford, uh, Siemens, uh, you know, Volkswagen, BMW, all selling more cars in China than their own country now. So that, uh, you know, uh, but China have all the, all, the, all, the, all the deficit. So that's probably contributing some of those uh, understanding and problem. Look at NAFTA. Okay. Uh, pretty uh, soon after he took off his President Trump abandoned uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement uh, uh, initials to stand for NAFTA. Uh, means uh, he's not happy about the two neighboring countries uh, 
and uh, instead he signed a new agreement with Mexico and Canada introducing the very important and controversial article of a poison bill. And that has caused uh, the consternation of uh, Europeans and Chinese. Japanese are no exception. So what do you think of uh, uh, the impact of uh, uh, his unilateral withdrawal from so many multilateral frameworks like TPP and he's known for also terminating the Paris Climate Change Pact. Yes, uh, I think the president has a, a, a profound skepticism uh, about these multilateral institutions. There's this narrative that underpins the president's view that the United States was this benevolent giant and after the Second World War uh, helped to rebuild Europe with the Marshall Plan and helped Japan rebuild, provided a nuclear umbrella under which our trading partners were able to flourish uh, and what did they do? Did they pay tribute to the United States? No, they, they rebuilt their industries and they competed with us and they built so social welfare systems. This narrative, I think, is fairly prominent among uh, nationalists in America. Uh, this is a grievance-based sort of uh, view of, of, of the world. You know, his, his view of NAFTA also was, is colored by this idea that uh, it, there was this giant sucking sound, as Ross Perot once said in the United States, that uh, all these jobs were going to be lost and all this investment was going to be lost in Mexico. That really did not happen. Uh, th to me, going after uh, revising the NAFTA would not have been a priority. Uh, we already had the NAFTA revised under the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The TPP was the renegotiation of NAFTA. All of the uh, important provisions, modernizing provisions, were in the TPP, plus there were nine other countries. Uh, now we've lost uh, access to the markets of those nine other countries. American consumers and American businesses have lost uh, uh, low-priced imports to, for intermediate goods and for, for, for consumption. Many more people, many trillions of dollars more of GDP had we stayed in the TPP. Uh, so, look, I, I don't disagree with President Trump that there are some uh, major frictions in some of our relationships, and especially with China. Uh, some of these issues have been brought to the attention of previous administrations. Uh, this president decided he wanted to do something about it. The problem is he's going about it unilaterally. We have rules that have worked extremely well. The WTO has been a very good forum. Uh, there's a narrative in Washington that the WTO does not work well to discipline China. The facts are quite the contrary. China has done uh, very well of coming into compliance with uh, cases that it's lost at the WTO. There have been about 41 cases brought against China. Uh, but in, uh, the, so the president is pushing this narrative that, oh, we, we have to do this by ourselves and everybody else get behind us and we're going to uh, 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 lead in this trade war. I thought it would have been more effective if we went to the WTO, maybe with the Europeans whose companies have had the same sorts of problems and said, look, we, we have a problem here. Let's try to get it resolved. And I think that would have been the right way to do it. Uh, now, the, the United States is an international scoff law. We are really weakening the rules-based system of trade, which has been key to world economic growth for the past 70 years. Most of us uh, see the problems. The issue is, uh, what is the solution? Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, Daniel said wisely that uh, there should be a right way of fixing the problem. But what causes a consternation in the world over is the, uh, what we call unilateralism. What do you think of uh, the re issues concerning the reform of the WTO? No, I, I think uh, uh, Daniel was, was right. Actually, he was mentioned about uh, this TPP and, and also with the TPP 11 countries. Uh, I think that is really the right approach. You know, we need an upgrade of WTO. We need a new you know, a mechanism for, for trade, e-commerce, digital economy, and all the uh, artificial intelligence. We need a new system. I mean, WTO has been really uh, not really moving ahead since Doha Run, but then this TPP is really a great, uh, I think, uh, advance of the rules and uh, of the trade. So, so, so uh, for example, CCG is, is really encouraging China to join TPP in, a, in, a, in a, uh, one term allowance it's uh, 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 pulled out. And, that, and now it's become CPTPP. Still, I think it's good for China to, to join that. And then, uh, so that we can have the Asia Pacific. I mean, eventually, US public will come back. So, so I think that uh, the better way to go is that we should, on the one hand, reform WTO. Uh, we should really, you know, like this e-commerce e thing China already signed into it. It's great. And also we have seen that, you know, out of 20 largest digital com uh, company in the world, uh, China, U.S. take half-half. So the two countries, G2, has a lot of uh, 
stayed there to really work out something on the, on the e-commerce platform, uh, digital economy. But also, on the other hand, we should also push for the regional integration on trade like CPTPP. China should uh, be part of the CPTPP so that we can contribute. I, I, I believe that probably after so long, nine rounds of negotiation with, uh, with U.S., China probably already upgraded many uh, criteria that is already qualified for TPP. Uh, if Vietnam is qualified for TPP, why not China? So I think we could have special provisions for SOE reforms and everything that China can be really uh, a big force to push multilateralism and eventually we can draw back the U.S. into multilateralism and we can build up this FTAAP, you know, uh, a free trade agreement for Asia Pacific so that in the future we have something to really upgrade WTO and also maybe a give a little pressure to WTO to reform. But the core issue concerning the prospects of WTO and the reform of this multilateral body, I'm afraid, one of the issues on the table is whether China remains a market-oriented status, whether China is a developing country. Now, it is on these issues that the United States, along with many other major economies, seriously disagree. China has already become the second biggest economy, the biggest trading power. Now, Daniel, um, where exactly do you stand on these two critical issues? Uh, because without reaching a consensus on these two, I'm afraid there's no future for whatever attempt at the reform itself. Yes, I think the WTO, it's crunch time at the WTO. It has been 25 years since there's been any real liberalization, trade liberalization at the WTO. The Uruguay round, which ended in 1994 and created the WTO in 1995, was the last successful round. We had the Doha round, which began in 2001, uh, and I thought it was a dead on arrival. There just wasn't enough interest uh, in, uh, among several countries in engaging in any more reform. It was this uh, consensus-based model. You needed to have consensus among 150-something countries at the time. Uh, nothing was agreed until everything was agreed, something called the single undertaking. So I think the legislative or the liberalizing function of the WTO has been put in jeopardy, and the WTO needs to look at other models for liberalization. Henry mentioned the TPP as, a, as a, this critical mass approach. The United States and Japan had about 40 percent of the global economy involved in that. Uh, I think it would have attracted Korea and maybe Thailand, and I think China probably would have wanted to join. It probably would have been called the free trade area of the Asia Pacific. That could have been migrated into the multilateral system. So right now, though, uh, the United States is uh, withholding support for any new judges at the appellate body. The appellate body is the Supreme Court of the adjudicative system at the WTO. Normally, there are seven judges in the stable. There's uh, only one currently. There are, there are three currently, and that's the minimum you can have. And two of them, two of their terms expire this year, which will only leave one, which means that it'll, the, the adjudicative function will cease to exist. Mm -hmm. So I think if, if, the, if China, uh, uh, the issue of uh, developing country and subsidies, uh, that is one of the issues. And I think China should be willing to say, okay, r right now countries are allowed to designate, self-designate themselves as developing, and that entitles them to certain benefits or uh, excuses them from certain reporting requirements. It's not that significant, and if we're interested in saving the system, uh, I think that, that we can find agreement there. I think we can o overcome that particular hurdle. Uh, and, and, uh, but we do need to expand the scope of the WTO to include e-commerce trade and things like that, like Henry was talking about. Henry, what do you think of using surrogate state mm -hmm. in judging uh, whether China uh, has violated sort of uh, policies of uh, no subsidies, uh, no dumping? Because uh, this has concerned the Chinese authorities for years. It is this issue that has caused a lot of debates in the CCG uh, yeah. uh, roundtable conference. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the, the roundtable of CCG uh, just happened. I, I think it's really relevant. I mean, we had uh, Mr. Song Ziping. He was the chairman of China, one of the largest uh, SOE, but he was saying, you know, his company has uh, been listed in Hong Kong. There's 40 percent of public shares, and then there's also some private sector. So it's a mixed economy uh, of the company, uh, mixed ownership of the company, uh, of, even though it's called SOE. So, so I think uh, China is really lacking, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, of explaining itself clearly. To the, to the international community of how this company operates. But on the other hand, I also think that uh, uh, now China, uh, according to our uh, you know, own government report, now we are approaching the world central stage. We are now become second largest economy. We are having this uh, uh, very uh, gigantic uh, BRI plan. 
So probably, uh, you know, China would not be viewed as a very poor developing country now, uh, compared with eight, 19 years ago when China joined WTO. So I don't know if, if WTO would have some kind of categories like, um, it's not developed, it's not, you know, least developing. We but, are emerging but, market. But, but, but newly developed, <laughs> maybe newly developed, or, or emerging developed. Something that we can have a, a, a neutral category so that uh, we can push this forward. But Americans have to look at things in black and white terms, uh, particularly for those from Texas state, uh, like cowboy, uh, they love and hate. So China, uh, therefore, falls victim to this uh, uh, traditional mentality of uh, the United States. Now, wh what do you think of the surrogate issue? Uh, the surrogate, uh, surrogate values for trade remedies, are you speaking of? Yeah, the, the using the third country to judge whether China uh, uh, has practiced uh, uh, subsidies and dumping. Yes. Well, that's how I started my career in trade policy. I was a trade remedies uh, analyst working for law firms in Washington representing companies caught up in uh, dumping disputes. So the United States has a methodology called the non-market economy methodology. The Europeans do as well. And other uh, Western countries have had that over the years, and many of them have given, given up on it. Uh, when China acceded to the WTO in 2001, uh, the United States and all standing members of the WTO agreed that they would maintain the non-market economy status for no longer than 15 years. So That's what we call the grace period. That's right. So by December uh, 11th, 2016, the United States and Europe were supposed to stop treating China as a non-market economy. Uh, the United States and China have both insisted on preserving their, their right to do that. To me, uh, the anti-dumping law, uh, the authorities can find very high incidents of dumping whenever they want. I don't think it's a very uh, above board process. Uh, so I don't think, I think we could have graduated China to market economy status uh, and still had uh, dumping cases where, uh, where high margins of dumping were found because it's a political outcome. Uh, but we've decided to allow this, this friction to remain. Uh, it's, it's a bogus way of calculating dumping. And the whole idea of dumping is if a uh, foreign company is selling in your market at, at low prices, it could drive your producers out of business and then they can raise the prices. Uh, the fact is you can't measure dumping by saying, by measuring Chinese prices, for example, by uh, valuing factors of production in India or Indonesia using these uh, strange surrogates, uh, it, it comes up with a, with a very convoluted comparison. And the whole methodology is flawed and, and should be abandoned. Thank you very much. You are watching Dialogue with uh, Mr. Daniel Atkinson and Mr. Wang Hui Yao. We are discussing the impact of unilateralism after President Donald Trump became President of the United States. We'll be back in a short while. Stay with us, please. Welcome back. Harry, do you think uh, this practice of unilateralism is likely to cease or to be stopped should President Trump fails, uh, fail to be re-elected again? So Donald Trump is, a, is, is not a root of problem. It's a symptom. You know? I mean, the, the root of problem is that, as I said at the beginning, that this globalization of global practice falling behind global practice. You know, we are probably doing it too far away, and then you, we're still using the sovereign state. We're still using this uh, old trading uh, mechanism so that we cannot really catch up with the progress of the uh, world trade economy so that uh, uh, the, the, the wealth is not evenly distributed. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the tiny percent, eight person in the Wall Street, probably counts about uh, the eight richest people in the world, let's not, not say that way, uh, counts half of the population in the world. So, so you know, what do you think? So uh, that could cause a lot of problems for, for people in, in, in the Midwest and, uh, and, and, and also in the rest of the world. So I think the way to go for that, I think this, is a, this current what, uh, Trump uh, uh, phenomenon is a correction for the globalization, and uh, so that uh, we can better improve that. The globalization is still good. It's, it is still really, uh, I think, it's the right direction. But then we have to adjust that, like we reform WTO, like we can push for TPP, like we can have also have uh, China play more role, like we can how to integrate a Belt and Road Initiative into the global uh, system, so that we can have a new me mechanism, new impetus for the global economy, and we can still continue to sustain the prosperity and the uh, uh, development of the world, rather than we still use the old model, uh, uh, you know, attacking the new reality, which is, I think is not working. That's where we refl reflected of this both Democrat and Republican consensus on the, uh, you know, if there is a consensus on the globalization issue. Daniel, a second look at the history of unilateralism 
Perhaps we could go back to the year 2008 when the financial meltdown wreaked havoc with the world economy and the United States uh, started to give a second look, a uh, second thought about uh, whether they should still provide public service and public products uh, for what is called multilateralism, uh, so on and so forth. When it comes to China, easily the two parties across the aisle would come together in the consensus to bash China and to single out China as the most devastating threat to the U.S. national security, quote unquote. But what about the European Union? What about Japan and ROK? Now, if uh, this president uh, were to continue uh, the practice of unilateralism, all of these allies of the United States will be hurt. So, do you think it is on this particular point that Democrats would also take side with your president? I think there is bipartisan support for President Trump's uh, rigid approach to China, mm -hmm. uh, but there's not bipartisan support for unilateralism. So I think when President Trump is gone, we will see the, the next president, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, recognizing the importance of the multilateral institutions, recognizing that uh, you know you attract more bees with honey, uh, and you can you can uh, you know you need to woo your trading partners, and you can't. Uh, uh, browbeat them and tell them to get in line and, and, and have our backs to prosecute a trade war against China. But th the fact is that it's the multinational community, the U.S. multinationals, uh, which have been the strongest supporters of the U.S.-China relationship. And I think over the past several years, they've started to lose their enthusiasm. Uh, they, they no longer see China as this big pot of gold on the other side of the rainbow. And because of that, they are influencing policymakers. That's the way you know the democracy, democracy is supposed to work. You know, you reflect the, the the views of your constituents. And these companies are saying, we need pressure from the U.S. government to compel the Chinese government to to change practices. So that's why I think that there's broad bipartisan. It's prob there's prob this is probably the only Trump policy for which there is broad bipartisan support. But the unilateralism is uh, is challenged quite a bit, and, and there are a lot of people very concerned about. The United States undermining the very institutions it authored and it, it erected uh, to allow the, the world to move from the ruins of World War II to this modern situation in which we have eradicated a large chunk of poverty. It's great. Let's look at the worst case scenario, Henry. Uh, in our uh, roundtable discussions, uh, we focused on the issue of a Thucydides trap. Yeah. And Professor Graham Allison said uh, there are. There were four cases, four wars, uh, so, sorry, four cases that uh, didn't uh, say directly that the, two, the rising power and the uh, residing power would have to have a confrontation. No, you are right. I think that, uh, uh, well, we're actually, CC just hosted the Graham Allison spoke at the, our think tank uh, about three weeks ago. Uh, I, I understand your, his case, but he was analyzed 16 cases, 12 of them, uh, you know, the existing power and, and coming up power uh, had clashes, and four avoided that. I think there was a hotly debated the issue in, in our conferences that this actually, what I see is that it's, it's totally different now. We are in a totally different time than old history. The context is very different. Very different now. It's so much intertwined. It's, uh, you know, we are constantly in connection with, with each other. The wealth is so much, uh, how many times greater than all the history we have. And then uh, people are really uh, seeing the war. Uh, the mountain is high, uh, the emperor is far away, days are gone. So people are well informed. So. Plus, we have all those, you know, assets, hard assets. Who can afford a war? I mean, you look at the Beijing, all the skyscrapers, you look at the Washington, you know. I mean, it, it would be crazy to have that kind of a thinking. So, so I think that uh, people may say that, but in reality, it's so difficult to decouple, so difficult to separate. Now, if the U.S. wants to do that, European would not agree. I mean, you see that we just had the, uh, this uh, China-France uh, Global Governance Summit. Merkel came, Rome came, you know, all the, all the head of the uh, European Union came. So and Italy signed up for uh, BRI. That's right. So the UK so joined the AIIB to the dismay of the yeah. United States. So, so I think that, uh, you know, the, now uh, China and US may, may become a, a G2 rivalry, but then European is a balance in power. So ideologically, maybe US, uh, EU is more sided with US, but economically, EU is sided with China. So in the end, the, the, the business interest will prevail. I think the interest will, you know, will bound everybody together. So 
when we China said uh, uh, you know, build the shared future of the mine country, let's build the shared interest of the mine country first. But the Angela Merkel said that let's have a shared values. <laughs> uh, as well, yeah. You know, shared interest, shared, yeah. uh, shared uh, destination as well. Daniel, you, you, your linkage between unilateralism and the Thucydides trap is very valid uh, because in Graham Allison's book, he documents 16 cases, 12 cases lead to conflict, four cases conflict is avoided, and in each of those four, the common denominator is some international institutions that s sort of uh, restrain the power of the uh, incumbent power and the rising challenger. So when you're abandoning multilateral institutions, I think you are leading, going down a path that is more likely to lead to strife. So uh, it's very important that we have things like the WTO and other international agreements uh, so that to, to, to check the, the, the powers of the United States and China in this case. What do you think of the consensus shared by the Chinese uh, to continue down the road of having cooperation instead of a confrontation with the U.S.? No, I think that the, the head of diplomacy uh, w works fine. I mean, in this case, President Trump and President Xi are really working very well. And then the real problem is that if there, if there's a, if there is uncertainty, if there is no confidence, both economies suffer. You see, the Chinese stock market, you know, come down 30 percent last year. Now it's 30 percent comes back, and the U.S. is at all-time high, and then fluctuate so much with the trade news uh, negotiating every day. So I think the both business community has voted on the stock market on this issue. So I think it's really now for, the, for both economies to really uh, 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 calm down. And also international agencies like IMF said, you know, if China keeps this going, you know, GDP growth will, will, will come up. Same for the U.S. So, so I think that business community has voted with their own. And then President Trump President will take into consideration of all the, you know, business that which is, drives the world around. I mean, that's fundamental bottom line. I think the both presidents have realized that both leaders want to do something on that. Let's look at the last question then. Let's look at the impact of a, a trade war, which is a, uh, looming larger on the horizon, on the economic performance of China. There have been a lot of policy discussions and debates in China about what's going to happen next. Mm. Uh, quietly, people agree, yes, this is an opportunity for China to further open up and to further reform. But are you pessimistic or cautiously optimistic about China being the second economy and perhaps uh, surpassing the United States uh, in the foreseeable future in terms of economic total? I think that's inevitable. Uh, China is the world's most populous country. It's on the trajectory to surpass the United States in terms of economic heft. That shouldn't be something that uh, makes us want to blow up the world. Uh, there is an opportunity here uh, for reform. As Henry was mentioning, there is profound interdependence between the U.S. economy and the Chinese economy and the rest of the world. So we do have a, an obligation, really, to the, to the world to make sure that there isn't this decoupling. Uh, and, but if there is, I think what will happen is you will see China and the United States competing for the hearts and minds of the developing world. China's already miles ahead with the BRI initiative, with investment in Africa. But the problem there is if the, if the world bifurcates, breaks up into two spheres, the scope for economies of scale is cut in half. Our wealth uh, uh, projections are totally limited by that. We need to recognize that our interdependence is a good thing and that we need to overcome these frictions uh, with credible uh, agreements. It's unpredictable that we're going to have a parallel market with the United States on one side of China the other. But what about the European Union, Japan, ROK, India? These swing votes will perhaps decide the future uh, of a community that we share. I'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>